up together against the United States and build a new United Socialist system. However, without mobilization, a mass-based revolution would not take off. The Vietnamese revolution was mass-based, but surprisingly, the bulk of literature associated with it, with some outstanding studies apart, viewed such mobilization myopically. Given the geographical, economic, political, psychological, and socio-concept differences between the South Vietnamese, Daniel forces, how the front statically proved so efficient baffles historians even today. A good number of books have been have come up, mostly by Western writers, but are often biased. The perusal of their writings throws up an objective understanding of the NLF tensile strength, its strategy, and extent of success against powerful forces, and forms the content of the present study. Vietnam is a country, a very important country in Southeast, or Southeast Asia. And from the very beginning of its existence, it suffered a repeated aggression and subjugation. It has to its credit a history of struggle in wars against the Chinese, the French, the Japanese, and the American forces. They are doers war the days against them. But they never forgot that these people were alien ruling over them. Now, uh, they rose time and against this alien domination and managed to establish their identities as a separate country within Asia. 19th century Vietnam, like other Asiatic countries, recorded Europeans vis-à-vis uh, <clears throat> -vis the Chinese, then um, Japanese, and in course of time, in order to meet the given problem, uh, they developed their own traditional way to establish themselves or to organize themselves into a different uh, organization under the banner, first it was ICP, that is Indo-Chinese Communist Party, thereafter Viet Minh, and finally, at the time of the partition in 1900, after the Geneva Agreement of 1954, but, uh, uh, Vietnam was partitioned into the two parts, and North Vietnam and the South Vietnam, and it provided that the country should be reunited following the general elections in July 1956. The North Vietnamese expeditions for the holding the referendum were denied by the president of the South Vietnam, Ngo Dinh Diem, with a strong US support, U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles said that imposition of the communist system on Southeast Asia should not be passively accepted, but should be met by united action. But the Vietnamese accepted this partition with a deep deterrence and gave them uncontested control of only half of the country. As Wilford, Wilfred, Bachet described in his book, North of the 17th Parallel, Saigon at the end of the 1954, was a city of gangsters and assassins, of shots, knives, thirst, and a struggler caught in the dark, a city where people spoke in whispers and disappeared without leaving a trace. Beautifully lit and decorated shop front displayed luxury articles, but little which had any relation to Vietnamese needs or purchasing power. The major blame, the major part of the blame for turning the autocratic system in the South Vietnam that belonged to the US policy makers of that time. As the US perception could see no further than a conflict between the forces of freedom and communist, they never prompted them, the South Vietnam to introduce reforms on the socio-economic front. I'm speaking, uh, skipping some uh, portions. And as a result, a very small party emerged on 20th December 1960 by a group of opposition and the person who were behind this 
establishment of the party, Guan Tanta Path. And it was popularly known as Liberation of uh, National Front for the Liberation of South Vietnam. And in Vietnamese, it is called Mat Tran Dan Tok Giai Phong Mien Nam Biet. The founding principles of this NLF were to provide a new forum to approve the old political setting, habits, and commitments, and replace with new ones. The new society to be based on a socialistic pattern of group membership, organization, and idealistic commitments with socialist background. The pertinent point of this study is how the NLF scored a victory over the technologically advanced adversaries, the United States. The US endeavor were mobile backed by the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization partners, the France, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Pakistan, Thailand, and the Philippines with supply of man and material. Taiwan and South Korea also lent their support. The NLF, on the other hand, fought single-handed and yet emerged victorious. No doubt, it had the support of the communist countries, the then Soviet Union and China, but the Soviet Union, though it supplied some strategic weapons, never sent its army. The main strength of the NLF was its ideological posture, strategic perception, and effective mobilization. It considered peasants as an important and effective vehicle of its success. It established underground camps, initiated training programs, and added to relevant educational literary campaigns and programs of social and economic. This country. Oh. Vietnamese revolution might be said to have begun with the nationalism and ended with the communism. Two successive generations of Vietnamese fought for the national independence, but had achieved no success other than to keep the revolutionary spirit alive. Their failure, however, prepared the way for the NLF Gada, who finally emerged as liberators of the country. The liberation of South Vietnam, uh, the period from 1962 to is considered symbol symbolically the most crucial period of political development in the history of the Vietnam. The victory was unprecedented, extraordinary, and unique. It had to fight against the superpower besides its internal enemies. The Saigon regime had superior technology, sophisticated training, and multinational forces, and the vast resource at its command. With all those advantages, however, it was routed. In the history of the Afro-Asian world, the NLF victory was truly of unparalleled. However, the period spanning one and a half decade, uh, the dynamics of this liberation of South Vietnam is manifested, described as truly a second independence after the first one on 2nd September of 1975. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please stay back here. Do you have some questions or comments on this paper? Anyone of you? Now I have a, a little comment to make. Yeah, please. Just on to it. I'm no expert of Southeast Asia. Just generally. Sorry, it's just for your sake. Okay. I'm sorry for telling you, but it is for the biggest certificates. For almost all the way. <laughs> 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 These are the old guys. So uh, I will say uh, that uh, you want to ask some question or? that uh, Vietnam uh, emerged as the epicenter of resistance to Western Americanism in general, and American imperialism, 
in particular. And uh, of course, it faced China also, and to an extent, too. Uh, it was very difficult for a small Vietnam to live. Yeah. But, you know, a few China looking larger what it's made. But then again, uh, what we see at the present time, uh, that Vietnam closing up to Western countries, yeah. especially the United States of America, still, yeah. away from China. So this is again uh, the turn of the uh, last century and uh, first decade of the present century. And, a lot of upheavals went there. You took the name of John Foster Dallas. He was an out, out and out imperialist. And he was against any kind of third world uh, yes. national movements. Uh, we, I being a man of West Asia working on it, I would know that how angry he was when Nasser uh, nationalized the Suez Canal. And he was the person instrumental in getting these three powers, Israel, Britain, and France, for the tripartite and English, uh, Egyptian uh, nation. And Egypt was very close to India because of Nehru Nasser, long long in those days, and long time. So it's a nice paper. Uh, if you want to sum up the things what I said, we have to okay. uh, one or two sentences uh, and all that. Sure, sure. So what I find today, sir, because in 1963, there is a very, very important year in which we find that one of the American presidents, John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. There was a uh, uh, lot of uh, trouble started in the Vietnam itself in many months. They committed self emolutions themselves against the atrocities of the Americans. Uh, uh, Soviet Union was so much so uh, helpful to the Vietnamese in order against to keep the Americans away from the area. They themselves got disintegrated uh, in the modern time we find. China who helped very much to the Vietnamese, uh, also we find thereafter uh, their relations uh, got disturbed. And now the Vietnamese very boldly they are sending a message in Asia itself, like Asian tigers. So what I mean to say that because of this war, three million people died alone in the Cambodia during the Pol Pot region that was also associated with the war. 50,000 Americans lost their lives, it is still fresh. Some more than one million Vietnamese lost their lives of their no fault. And I think in the present, the past we cannot just forget in which Vietnamese tremendously have come up and now they are giving a very tough competition in the region against the, though the border countries, the China and the Vietnamese maintain belief, uh, the same ideology, but with the different their interest. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Nice paper. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, uh, friends, uh, we have the blueprints. Uh, of uh, the presidential address at last. And I would request my colleague, uh, Ashok Kumar, to read it. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mukesh. Uh, <laughs> you can present the press of the book. You can, uh, you can, you can go there. Thank you, sir. Actually, this is the presidential address by Professor Manoranjan Mohanty. He is a political scientist with expertise on China, Indo-China relations, and uh, now in his absence, Professor Shamir Hassan Sahab is chairing the session, and he is an expert on West Asian uh, history and West Asian politics and he has got a big name, <laughs> what to say. Now I am <laughs> going to write down to read the paper. Uh, Alternative Historiography, Dan Chen's geo Paradigm. All cultures are intercultural. 
they have evolved through a process of interaction among people of different regions, especially neighboring regions, exchanging ideas and practices over time. Sometimes this interaction might appear to be a, way, a one way traffic, but when viewed over a long time span, the interaction may actually turn out to be two way. This two way process may not always be a benign exchange. It may have moments of dream for one side or the other, or of the attempted imposition of a value system by a victor, facing resistance by a victim. But seen through the historical process, the totality of the experience presents the many dimensions of the interaction, as a struggle, as mutual complementarity, or a charm. Ultimately, the interaction constitutes a process of mutual learning, the history of civilization is thus a dynamic process of intercultural evolution. When a nation, a state or a people of a geographical region, uniqueness of its culture, ignoring its intercultural formation, a major dimension of history is missed. Herein lies the distinction between the geopolitical paradigm that governs much of the state policy and international relations in the modern era and the geo-civilizational paradigm that Jack Tang Chang advocates and which is his main contribution to the study of history and culture. In this theoretical note, written incidentally not by a historian or a cultural studies expert, but by someone interested in the methodological questions involved in the study of terms of discourse, we will first stress the significance of Tang Chang's enterprise and then discuss the meaning of the term interculturalism and geocivilizational paradigm. This is the this is then illustrated by reference of Tanchan's uh, study of Indian China interactions extending over two thousand years interaction which he characterized at various points with the descriptors Sino Indic civilization, Himalayan themes, Simian civilization, Himalaya sphere and finally, China, semicolon of 5,000 year policy. The Tan Chang's perspective is then considered as a contribution to the emergence of an alternative historiography, a significant perspective. Based on a lifetime of intensive research on India and China, Tan Chang has developed a geo civilizational approach to analyze historical process. In India and China, 20 in India and China, 20 centuries of civilizational interaction and vibration, Tan and Zheng, 2005, year after referred as 20th century. Okay. Tan Cheng and Zhen Yin Cheng present a perspective of what can be called creative interculturalism, a process of cultural interaction that enriches the creative potentiality of all the participating units. This perspective not only explains the nature of the interaction over the two millennia period, but is a generalist theory that can apply to the understanding of the civilizational history of humankind on a global scale. That's where the importance of this perspective and of Tan Chang's contribution is located. The significance of Tan, Tan's perspective lies in the fact that intellectual history in the modern world is premised, is premised on theories of cultural conflict based on the gradation of cultures and civilization. European colonization, colonialism put the European culture on a high pedestal and using its economic and military power, promoted a knowledge system that propounded the superiority of Western civilization. In the course of the anti-colonial struggle, many philosophers and thinkers of Asia questioned this assertion. In India, M.K. Gandhi presented the thought critic of Western civilization in its in the Swaraj in 1909. Rabindranath Tagore had a different response. Tagore appealed the strength of Eastern values and thought and evolved a Russianist paradigm for the liberation of humankind. In doing this, Tagore deeply reflected upon the cultural and civilizational legacies of Asia, particularly of India and China. To institutionalize that, that reflection, he set up in China Bhavana Bhav for the study of Chinese culture in Vishwabhati University, Santiniketan, and invited Dan Yunsen to lead it. Dan Chen pursued, pursued the, the Tagore quest further. 
carried forward his father's vision and delved deep into researching the historical interaction between India and China. His finding from his lifelong, his lifelong investigation was that China, India and China have engaged in a mutually enriching cultural interaction very different from the concurred, concurred relationship that produced the superiority of the colonial culture. This intercultural perspective challenges much of the colonial era literature and its subsequent persons. The theories of culture that informed the policies of the colonial regimes also influenced foreign and security policies during the Cold War. Max Weber's theory of the differentiation of cultural system that favored the growth of capitalism and those that inhibited it has been a dominating framework guiding the understanding of the modern era. Weber's work, The Religion of China and The Religion of India, so how these two cultural systems possessed values and behavioral features which were in sharp contrast with those of the Protestant societies of Europe. Therefore, according to the Bavarian framework, not only capitalist industrialization but also liberal democracy were unlikely to succeed in China or India, or for that matter in Eastern societies in general. Much of this has been disapproved in practice in recent decades as both capitalism and democracy in their local variants have continued to grow in these and other non-Western societies. As against the Bavarian theory of culture, Tan Chang's notion of interculturalism sees the plural and dynamic character of all cultures. One doesn't have to strain and reinterpret Confucianism to demonstrate that it is compatible with the capitalist entrepreneurial development underway in contemporary China. One doesn't have to trace the origin of capitalism to the evolution of Vaisya caste and the Banya community in India. An alternative perspective on how civilizations evolved would enable one to capture such trends in society resulting from interaction from groups and getting different trips in production process within a region or across regions within a country. Interculturalism can avoid the pitfalls of cultural determinism. I will go on the section on critic of xenocentricism and then I will read out the concept of interculturalism and geo civilization and then I will try to sum. I will try to read out the last portion. During the Cold War, a formulation that dropped the imagination of Western and particularly American academics as well as policymakers was xenocentrism. Xenocentrism, a term which was coined by the eminent American historian John King Fairbank. China was believed to see itself as the Middle Kingdom, the literal English translation of the Chinese term for China. John Zhuo considered itself as the center of the world and implying that it has a sense of superiority with its, the rest of the world. The opium war was raised by the British to destroy that sense of superiority and defeat Chinese res resistance to uh, Britain's opium trade and to establish British control over much of the Chinese economy. The Chinese Revolution, according to Fairbank, was mainly a nationalist movement to regain lost honor. Tan Chen had presented a detailed critique of this whole argument on xenocentrism in a two-part article in China Report as early as 1973. Going into the genesis of the term, Zhang Guo, Ping Zia, and Tan Zhu, and the terms used for foreigners, Yi, he refuted point by point the alleged a yeah, hierarchical and non-egalitarian xenocentric view of the external world, which, as he put it, had justified imperialist aggression on China and Cold War politics. Western imperialist aggression on aggression on also served the U.S. Cold War politics, but thanks to the intellectual monopoly that the West enjoys, the xenocentrism argument persisted persist in the western and laterally the global laterally the global mind now that china has risen to the <coughs> status of a world power this notion is used by many to show that the chinese rulers as well as the people had uh, always had a middle kingdom complex that notion provides a theoretical backdrop to the notion of a china threat which many security analysts propound even Xi Jinping's call to realize the Chinese dream of rejuvenation of the Chinese nation 
has been put in the framework of xenocentrism by Western analysts. Xi Jinping's active globalism after the 19th Party Congress of 2017, especially the Belt and Road initiatives, have been interpreted by many commentators as the reassertion of the Middle Kingdom complex, which is also subject of much debate. Then Chung's and Tan Chung and many other have provided much historical evidence to substantiate the point that the concept of Middle Kingdom referred to the Central Kingdom, which consolidated power by defeating the surrounding kingdoms in China in the third century BC. If interculturalism challenges the theoretical propositions governing colonial and Cold War forces and policies, it is in fundamental opposition to the class of civilization thesis of Samuel. Huntington, which has guided the thinking of Western leaders during the era of globalization and post-9-11 mindset that governs U.S. policy. According to him, the world had seen conflicts between princes, nation states, and ideologies in the past. In the future, it is likely to see the class of civilizations, civilizations, civilization defined as the highest cultural grouping among people. Huntington talks about the civilizational faulting all lines that have become manifest between uh, Western and Islamic civilization and the Confucius Islamic connection that has emerged to challenge Western interests, values, and power. Suffice it to, the, it to say here that Huntington thesis that Western civilization was, was bound to come into confrontation with the Islamic Confucian, Confucian uh, civilization betrays an extremely narrow concept of civilization with boundaries which according to him seem impregnable. The Huntington thesis has several assumptions about the history which can be questioned. Which can be questioned. Politically, it may have turned out to be a self-fulfilling policy misguiding the US invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan and their global counter-terrorism operations, but already that phase of history seems to be gaining. The emergence of many regional formations such as BRICS as catalyst of global transformation defies the civilizational plot lines that Huntington talked about. The decline of Western domination of the world is a historical trend not as anticipated by Huntington who had theorized on the bounty of the fall of the Soviet Union and the tide of global expansion of the market economy. As against the Huntington thesis, Tan Chen presents a view of interculturalism that is based on the connected histories of peoples and the regions of the world. This history highlights the interaction among human groups across the globe and the movement of ideas and theories, values and technology, and natural products and arts. The Tan Chen's notion of interculturalism is a theoretical tool that challenges the cultural theories of colonial and the Cold War eras and joins the present battle for a cultural understanding of the future of humanity in the 21st century. With the upsurge of cultural identities all over the world, as people seek political power to govern themselves and protect their language, culture, and dignity, it is very important to comprehend the notion of interculturalism and the politics underlying the cultural discourses of the past and present. Now I will read out the portion uh, <clears throat> the concept of uh, interculturalism and geo-civilization uh, and after two paragraphs I will uh, approach him towards the end of this paper. Interculturalism without a hyphen between inter and culturalism emphasizes the fact that the interaction between cultures has produced a new level of synthesis between the cultures. A simple definition of culture is that it is a pattern of belief, values and behavior of a body of people. A civilization simply understood is a cultural milieu of a large number of people that extends over a long span of time and a relatively wider space. A civilization is also about beliefs, values, and behavior, but those which acquire a long presence in history and take from uh, and take form in music, art, literature, architecture, and ritual embodying and rituals embodying worldviews. A civilization has in it knowledge system that informs humans about uh, relationship with nature and among humans. We shall use these working definitions to proceed with our analysis, knowing fully well that definitions of such concepts are always problematic. 
It is useful to note the differences between intercultural and cross-cultural on one hand and multicultural on the other. Western anthropology engaged in a cross-cultural studies during a colonial period to understand the uniqueness of cultures in different parts of the world, mostly in the colonies of Asia and Africa. Many of these studies were motivated by a scholarly pursuit to discover the cultural traits of communities. Many were guided by Western curiosity to learn about cultures other than those of the home countries of the scholars. However, most of them were meant to provide the intellectual input for colonial governments. One thing was common among them, namely, they considered the objects of their study as bounded cultures, communities, which has very specific features in their physical and behavioral existence, being closed until they were exposed to the outside world, first by invading or migrant communities, and then the colonial administration. Cross-cultural perspective were pursued after colonial colonies got independence and become an important exercise for policy making during the Cold War era. The area studies program as well as the comparative development of studies programs promoted the US Social Science Research Council, uh, promoted by the US, research, uh, US Social Science Research Council, we are a package of cross-cultural studies during the entire Cold War period. The bonded view of cultures formed an important element of the social system theory of Talpa persons, persons and the political system theory by David Easton, in which a system was defined in terms of bonded. According to them, an appropriate political culture was a precondition for the successful practice of democracy. The Bavarian theory, which has been uh, extended to explain why the US type of pluralist, pluralist to democracy faced problems in non-Western societies such as India and China, in all these cases, the cultures of studied communities were considered as closed and stagnant until they were exposed to immigrants or invaders. On the other hand, the intercultural perspective considers all cultures as standing products of interaction. Rather than a monolithic view of culture, interculturalism sees multiple trends, even contradictory elements in a culture. While the cross-cultural perspective emerged during the colonial era, multiculturalism came to the fore in a different era. The context was the phenomenon of the rising non-European, non-white migrant population in the US, Canada, and Europe in the last two decades of the 20th century. The Euro-American population slowly came to terms with the presence of the Asian, African, Arab, and Latin Americans. Since Canada and the US were countries of European migrants who colonized the land of the natives, in the next, uh, in the new context, they needed labor from other countries for which they had to evolve the framework to absorb the migrant population. There was one trend from the white supremacists who were determined to maintain the purity of their culture. The broader trend was to find ways of coping with the new situation. Multicultural culturalism emerged in this context as a theory enabling recognition of the cultural identities of different groups composing society. Uh, recognition and difference were the two key terms. The US was not to, to be seen as a was white Anglo-Saxon protestant protestant entity, but uh, as a multicultural society where blacks, Catholics, Muslims, uh, Sinon, uh, Sikanos, Asians, and Arabs were entitled to similar privileges. Uh, multiculturalism was a response to the identity upsurge of many minorities who were to be assured that their cultures were not in danger. Uh, <clears throat> multiculturalism, too, had an inbuilt belief in the hierarchy of cultures that allowed its practitioners to maintain subtle terms, subtle form of uh, dominance over immigrant identities. It did not give equal respect to all cultures, though it provided some space for the cultural practices of various groups. If no doubt, it no doubt uh, acknowledged areas of confluence, dynamism, and the evolution of cultures. However, it did not grasp the fact that all cultures are product of interaction among cultures. As a result, we not only saw the decline of multiculturalism in the post-9-11 West, we saw the virtual assumption of the superiority of Western civilization on the one hand, propagated through the globalization of capital, and on the other hand, the worldwide drive against terrorism led by the US. 
Thus, the crucial element in the meaning of interculturalism is a process of mutual exchange of ideas and practices with respect for each other. Note that we have, uh, each other. Uh, this is the characteristic pattern of the 20th, uh, 20 centuries of uh, India-China interaction that Tan Chen has analyzed. More importantly, interculturalism is an element of the civilizational perspective on human history. The human habitat is important in Tan Chen's geo-civilizational paradigm, but as he puts it, it is not a horizontal speciality that is a, a spread in one direction backed by military power. It is a speciality that is uh, multi-directional and with uh, each one and with each one influencing the other and all gaining spirituality spiritually or culturally across regions. This is why from Tan Chen's perspective, countries like India and China should regard themselves as civilization states rather than nation states. This is the message from the two millennium long historical interaction between India and China. So I'm skipping some of the pages and coming on to the last section, uh, alternative historiography and recasting cultural questions. Tan Chen's works belong to the developing field of an alternative historiography of China and India, which questions several established notions. For instance, China as a stagnant society until it was exposed to the West. Second, the modernization paradigm. Third, the periodization based on such parameters. And of course, fourth, the much paraded idea of xenocentrism. The new formulation on connected regional history in the evolving process of globalization during the past 200 years have enriched this further. The field of xenoindology, once pursued as a great area of classical studies in Europe, is now growing steadily, discovering interconnections among civilizations and challenging many popular notions such as that of such as that of the Greek of India China contract contact from the twelfth to the eighteenth century. They take a cultural part in social sciences in the nineteen eighties into a new ring, going much beyond questioning the economic determinism of classical Marxism and the power of politics to redirect cultural development claimed by superpowers and rising nations. They present a comprehensive outlook of how civilizations have emerged in human history and of the current stage of civilizational development in different parts of the globe. Keeping these intellectual trends in view, we can derive several important premises for pursuing cultural discourse in the 21st century. First, all cultures have evolved in, in interaction with, the, with the other cultures. Therefore, each culture deserves respect. India-China studies have shown how the two civilizations invited each other to reciprocally learn and grow. Ji Zialin and Tan Zheng, among others, have asserted how the identity of each was set by the other. The interdependence of cultures is a historical phenomenon phenomenon that can be applied to every part of the world. Invasions, crusades, colonialism, etc. do what to assign superiority to the culture of the victor. Adversary seminal contributions showing how colonialism created orientalism to characterize Eastern peoples and their cultures was complemented by Lugui Wa Tiowo who pointed out how colonialism reshaped the mind of the colonized and denied the subject even the right to name things. This trend of decolonization of knowledge is now substantiated by the alternative historiography of Tan Chen and others. Their proposition is that the cultures of people everywhere must be taken seriously and with respect, acknowledging the links, linkages between one culture and another. Second, all cultures are plural, diverse, and even contradictory elements. Tan Chen shows this by noting the effects of Buddhism on Confucian, uh, uh, Confucian and Taoist practices and vice versa, varying from period to period and from place to place. The coming of Islam to Western China and, to, and of Christianity to Eastern China had their complex effects. How all of these inter interacted how all of these interacted with popular religions and the culture of local communities, including what are today 
called minority areas are a subject of much new debates uh, over recent decades. This view contests Bavarian characterizations giving fixed characteristics hostile to capitalism and democracy or uh, Fairbanks concept of xenocentric worldview. Each country had multiple regional and cultural streams, which had by today's standards many humanist and democratic uh, traditions as well as many authoritarian, illiberal practices. China and India have not only glorious have not only glorious and valuable traditions, discoveries and inventions, but also oppressed social structures and customs, such as food binding of women and untouchability. Third, civilizations and cultures have a history of continuous dynamics. Contrary to the near frozen stereotypes of Chinese or Indian civilizations, which many Western historians have presented, they were constantly absorbing new elements, improving production systems, rearranging social relationships, and finding new ways to cope, up, to cope with the, the natural environment. Much of this took place in response to interaction with other cultures even more when regions and groups interacted with each other within a larger territory. Danton's thesis on interculturalism and a geo-civilizational paradigm, despite their historical grounding, had a strong normative dimension, as all social science researchers have. The tradition of historiography associated with Fairbank II had uh, normative dimensions, characterizing Eastern societies in particular ways to advance Western interests and policy respective perspectives. The geo-civilizational paradigm, however, frankly advocates dialogue among civilizations and peoples on the basis of mutual respect and mutual learning. Many Western scholars are currently advocating such dialogue. The project initiated by G. Zilmin and Tan Zheng presents a huge challenge for historians and social scientists to investigate historical sources deeply and with objectivity to innovate methods of discovery and analysis and to fill many gaps that remain, that remain in the proposition. The yin-yang complementarity that Tan Chen sees in the 20th in 20 centuries of interaction between India and China illustrates an alternative uh, perspective on human history from self versus other to self and self. The South African term in the Zulu language, Ubuntu, which uh, I am because you are, which Mandela and Desmond Tutu revived as a framework of mutual living, conveys the same idea. Colonialism created the self versus other categories, creating the metropolitan values of Europe as the self and the colonies as the other. That has become the typology, the typology for reviewing several binaries in social science, social analysis. All ruling groups see themselves as self and the ruled as the other. The concept of modernization motivated the newly independent countries to become more like Europe and the US. The so-called social aspect process of sanskritization made lower castes becoming like Brahmins. This very method of hierarchical uh, classification is under question all over the world. And the last paragraph uh, of this address is, everywhere all oppressed groups and regions are seeking self-realization and self-determination. Thus, the new historiography points at a new moment in the civilization, civilizational history of humankind, where history is being reconstructed with the aid of new methodologies and fresh theoretical categories. This new stage in the changing terms of discourse on global history has profound meaning for human future. In that process, Dan Chen had made a monumental contribution. Thank you. You have just heard a very substantial presidential address as presented by Professor Mukesh. Uh, now, uh, it's time for lunch, I think. <laughs> <laughs>